Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Everybody Hallelujah. that's here this morning in our virtual family online, you are a part of this body and your presence matters. Do you receive that? Yes. Amen. 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 You are a part of this body and your presence matters. Do you know that when John the Baptist was baptizing in the river, they believed that millions of people came out to see him. Some of the estimates from theologians are 2 million people. Some estimates are 6 million people came to the river. Does anybody receive the word that's in that? Amen. The Lord said he's going to draw people to the house because the river is flowing in this house. Yes. God will draw them to the river. Does anybody receive that? Yes. But we've got to be willing to learn what the river is like. Just as my grandfather in Hannibal, Missouri had to learn how the river flowed, the Holy Spirit is going to teach us the flow of the river, understanding that as we learn about the flow of the river, hallelujah, the Holy Spirit can move the river any way that Holy Spirit wants to. Amen? But he's going to ruin you in the river. Yeah. Yeah. Woo! Woo! Hallelujah. He's going to ruin you in the river because once you really begin to become a person of the river, you're never going to feel at home outside of the river. Right. Have you ever heard the term in the natural realm, a fish out of water? <laughs> That's what you're going to become. That's what you're going to become as God ruins you in the river. Mm -hmm. Can I hear an amen? amen? So I want you to understand what's going to happen here. Mm -hmm. It's like the old prophet that said to the Lord, Lord, you tricked me. <laughs> you ever read that? Yeah. Lord, you tricked me. You knew once I tasted of who you were, I'd be satisfied with nothing else. Yeah. <laughs> Lord, may you ruin us in the river. Yeah. Amen? Amen. Lord, may you ruin us in the river. Yeah. Woo, hallelujah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, hallelujah. The river has been a theme of this house in the last several weeks. Yes. I'm going to tell you something, church. The river is going to be a theme until the Lord returns. Yes. Because the Lord says there's a river that flows from the throne of God. I believe that anything that's in the third heaven, it's not the heart of God that it remain in the third heaven. It's the heart of God that God's people stand on the bridge of faith and reach into the third heaven and lay hold of what's happening in the third heaven and pull it into the earth. I believe that. The Lord was talking about John the baptizer, John who loved the river, and he said, born of women are no greater than him. But, hallelujah, since that time, the kingdom of heaven has been taken by force. And forceful saints take it. God is releasing an anointing of force over his people. Hallelujah. And I'm going to say it again. He's going to anoint us to stand on the bridge of faith. And reach into the third heaven and pull out of the third heaven what it is that's going on there into this realm. The only one that wants you to think that the things of heaven are reserved for heaven is the enemy. Because the enemy is afraid that we will lay hold of the atmosphere and activity of the third heaven, of the throne room of God, and pull it into the earth, and the earth will be forever changed, and Jesus' kingdom will be established here on earth. Amen. And he'll come for the thousand year reign. That's why the enemy is fighting so hard against the initiatives of God. But God is releasing holy initiatives to his people right now. Amen. Some are receiving them. Some are saying, we just want to go on and do church as usual. <laughs> Let's be a people that receive the initiatives of God. Yes. Amen? Amen. Yeah. I'm going to say this again this morning. The church has heard a lot of sermons. If it was all about sermons, then the church would be walking in the supernatural right now. It's about hearing the word of God and doing 
the Word of God. Yes. Because faith comes by hearing. and hearing by the Word of God. We've all heard enough sermons. What we need is to be obedient to the Word that we've heard. Amen. Come on now. Amen. Because I love to listen to the messages of the men and women of old. God's been having me listen to messages from William H. Branham and, and, and Catherine Coleman and others. I could go through the list and you recognize every name. Do you know they were preaching the same thing 30, 40, 50 years ago that's being released right now? They were releasing the same word. Why is that? Because God's been waiting for a generation that will hear the word and be obedient to the word. Yes. And so he's been releasing the same word, waiting for a generation who will lay hold of that word, be obedient to that word, and bring the manifestation, therefore, of the word in the earth. Do you receive that? Yes. And I believe we are that generation. We are that generation. Right now, the eyes of the Lord are going to and fro throughout the earth, looking for a people after his own heart. Yes. The eyes of the Lord right now are going to and fro throughout the earth. And God is decreeing and declaring and He's looking for the people that receive His word and say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Because God is speaking the same word throughout the earth. Some peoples are saying yes. Other peoples are saying no. And you may think to yourself, how or why would a people ever say no to the Lord who call themselves believers? They don't necessarily say no to his face. They say no when they hear the word and then they walk away unchanged. They say no when they hear the word and then they just continue doing the things they've always been doing. They say no when they hear the word but are unfazed and unmoved by it. The word of God wow, should always move you. You know, the word says in the presence of the Lord is the fullness of joy. We should never be able to come out of the presence of the Lord unchanged. Yes. Because if we can, something's wrong. Yes. And the problem isn't with the one who is the God of the impossible. The problem is with the one who can be with him and then walk away unchanged. The Lord is saying, I'm beginning to call my people into account. I am beginning to call my people into account. No longer are the days that we can hear the word and go on like we heard nothing. God is beginning to call his people into account. Why? Because God releases everything through his people. And God is looking for a radical people who will say yes to him. And not be like the son whose father said, will you go work in the vineyard today? And he said, yes, but then he didn't go. The Lord says it's time for his people to say yes and mean it to him. The Lord says a lot of dangerous prayers have been prayed by my people. The Lord says some even in this body. Oh, I love the dangerous prayer prayers. <laughs> In fact, I was talking to Brother John the other day and he said, Pastor, I prayed a dangerous prayer. Wow. <laughs> talking to Brother Shane the other day, he said, Pastor, I'm pray I prayed a dangerous prayer. Dangerous prayers put you in dangerous places. But in the dangerous places, you're going to walk in your destiny and you're going to be used by God to shift the atmosphere yeah. and change yeah. things. Yeah. I believe in Jesus' earthly ministry, he walked into some places that other people wouldn't go. Yeah. But when he walked into those places, he was not shifted. He did the shifting. And God wants to teach us how to be a, pe be a people of the river that bring the river with us wherever we go. The river shifts everything. You know, God's had my heart on, on Missouri for some reason this morning. Well, the river, but... It's interesting in Missouri when the, the river would overflow, the Mississippi would overflow in cycles. And it would overflow into the area that we would call the bottoms. That was the lower areas. And when the overflow happened, the river would bring things into those areas. And when the water receded, it would take things away from those areas. But even as you traveled through those areas afterwards, you know the flood had come. 
<laughs> the Lord said his river is going to bring things into this house and his river is going to move things out of this house. Yes. The things that the river will move in, we want desperately. The things that the river will wash away, we need to let go of. Yes. And we need to understand this. But everything that's about to happen is going to have an element of change in it. And we've got to be a people that are willing to change. If, you're right, if your heart right now before the Lord is, Lord, I'm satisfied with where I'm at, you're going to be in big trouble. You've got to have a heart that hungers after God. And a heart that hungers and thirsts after God is a heart that's willing to be changed. Last time Holly Bailey was here, she pulled me aside after service. She said, Pastor, God wants to teach you a whole new way to minister. I had two reactions. My reaction in the spirit was, yes! My reaction in the flesh was, I thought I already knew how to minister. Which voice was I going to listen to? The voice of the Spirit and the voice of the flesh. And the Lord is saying right now in the book of Jeremiah, many, many are in the valley of decision. Many, many are in the valley of decision. Some are in the valley of decision because God has shifted the season and they're in a difficult place. Some are in the valley of decision because nothing has seemed to be happening and they're crying out to God. What do I do? Many, many are in the valley of decision because they know that God is asking them to change and they're struggling with whether or not they're going to do it. The Lord said in the valley of decision, the only decision to make is to surrender to the true vine. That's the only decision to make because the Lord says your destiny stands in the balance. Book of Ephesians says he chose us from the foundations of the world. He ordained good works for us to do before he ever said, let there be light. You are coming into your destiny. You are coming into the place and the timeline because he sees the beginning from the end. Where you're going to begin walking in your destiny. But every step of destiny you're going to take will only unfold with a yes to the Lord. And many are saying, Lord, when are you going to bring me into my ministry? And the Lord is saying, number one, it's not your ministry. It's my ministry that I'll release through you. And the Lord is saying, number two, I'm just waiting for your yes. I'm waiting for your obedience. I'm ready for you to be willing to change. Because he said, unless you change and become like a little child, you'll never see the kingdom of God. Come on. You'll never see the kingdom of God. Does anybody receive that in the Lord? Yes. And I don't know about you, but I want to see the kingdom. Yes. John the Baptist got to a place where he was imprisoned and his ministry came down to nothing. He prophesied what was going to happen. His own disciples came to him and said, John, everybody's going over to Jesus. And John said, he must, and I must, amen. He prophesied what was going to happen, but then when the fullness of the word came, his heart was not prepared for what it was going to look like. Many, many right now are in the midst of a situation that doesn't look like what they thought it was going to look like. But the Lord says, in the midst of this, will you praise me? In the midst of this, will you trust me? In the midst of this, will you worship me? In the midst of this, will you acknowledge that my goodness is not based upon your circumstance? My goodness is consistent, for I am good and my mercy endures forever. Amen. Hallelujah. See, he wants to change your condition. So he can change your position. And the condition is your heart. It's not your circumstances. Circumstances change, but what goes on in the heart is foundational. That's why God always goes after the heart. 
He said to Laodicea, you're pitiful, poor, blind, wretched, naked, but I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire. Yeah. Lord, how do I buy gold when you said I'm pitiful, poor, blind, wretched, and naked? What do I have? The only currency that matters to God, the currency of the heart. Yes. Yeah. Buy with your obedience. Mm -hmm. Buy with your surrender. Yes. Buy with the currency of your heart. Does anybody receive that in the Lord? Yes. 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 Hallelujah. You know, we've been talking the last several weeks about a shift. And if you're not being sh sifted, you're not being shifted. Let me say that again. God has been talking these last several weeks about a shifting. But if you're not being sifted, you're not being shifted. Does that make sense to anybody in the room? Come on. I remember my grandmother used to be a master baker and we'd walk into her kitchen again in Missouri and she'd have the sifter and she'd pour the flour into it and she'd go yeah. mm -hmm. and it would take that flour that was already ground but it would refine it even more mm -hmm. so that she could put it in her hands mm -hmm. and use it for her purpose. Yes. The Lord is saying right now I'm sifting you but it's going to lead to a shifting. And the sifting has a purpose. The enemy wants to say this is going nowhere. Nothing's happening. There's no point in it. There's no purpose. Give up. Why would God initiate it? If it wasn't going to happen. And it wasn't going to be amazing. Don't give up. Be willing to be sifted so you can be shifted. Does anybody receive that in the Lord? Yes. Well, Pastor, I came here today for an encouraging word. This is an encouraging word. This is an encouraging word. And here's another encouraging word. First comes the knowledge, then comes the test. Which means this word is going to bring, bring an activation in you. You're going to walk out of this place on the word. Do you receive that in the Lord? Yes. All right. Haggai chapter 2. We're going to see how much of this the Lord loves. To <laughs> I'm still not in my notes yet. <laughs> Hallelujah. Don't you love it? Isn't God good? Yes. Amen. Yeah. Haggai 2 verses 6 and 7. These are foundational words right now for where we're at in time, in history. Let's stand to honor the word of God. How many know Jesus is the word made flesh? Yes. Amen. The Lord says this, Haggai 2, verses 6 and 7. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Mm. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Who's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So when he spoke it, generations ago through the mouth of Haggai, it was as if he was speaking it directly to this generation. Yeah. Because I, the Lord your God, do not change, he says. Neither do my words. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will endure forever. Mm. The word of God is just going through people this morning yes. like a sword. I can see it, but it's a good thing in the Lord. Yes. Amen. He's piercing things that need to be right. pierced. Yes. He says, in a little while, I will once more shake the heavens and the earth. Yes, Lord, we want this. Yes. I want this. Yes. yes. The sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations. And the desired of the nations will come. And I will fill this house with my glory, declares the Lord God Almighty. Let me read the next verse, verse 8. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord God Almighty. And the glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord God Almighty. He's saying that to the house. He's saying that to the house. Yes. He's saying that corporately and he's saying that individually and your house is also your ministry. So he's saying that to the ministry he wants to bring forth through you. Yes, the glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord Almighty. And in this place I will grant my shalom, my peace, yes. declares the Lord God Almighty. You may be seated this morning. Mm -hmm. You know, Psalm 91 says this in verse 1. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High will dwell in the shadow of the Almighty. Somebody say the shadow of the Almighty. Shadow of the Almighty. In the Hebrew, another translation of the Lord Almighty is El Shaddai. 
And El Shaddai means the Lord who provides, who is more than enough. And the Lord says, He wants to be our secret place. He wants to be our shelter. And in Him, we will, we will find provision. Amen. With that in mind, let's look at Haggai chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. This is what the Lord Almighty, El Shaddai, your provider, says. Amen. Personalize the word. Don't ever let the word be impersonal and don't ever think that the word that God is speaking is for a different generation. It's for you right now because the word of God is living, it's alive, and it's now. Because it's spoken by the one with eyes like fire and feet like bronze and hair like wool who's the same yesterday, today, and forever. It's God breathed wherever it's released. Hallelujah. So don't ever say, well, this is for Israel. This, was, this is for the end times generation. This is for the sinners. This is for someone else. The word is always for you. And the word is the plumb line that our heart should be measured against. I got a little amen out of that one. So your El Shaddai says, in a little while, I will once more shake the heavens and the earth. Who's doing the shaking, church? The Lord is. Stop blaming the enemy for some shaking and shifting that's going on in your life right now. Amen. Because it's very easy to blame the enemy and miss the point. And the point is that God's doing the shaking and the sifting so he can do the shifting. Come on. It's real easy to say, oh, the devil's doing this. Oh, Slewfoot, whatever name you use for it, he's doing it. When maybe God is doing it to get your attention. Yes. And it's so much easier to blame the enemy than it is to hold ourselves accountable. Yes. Come on. Yes. Now, this is a strong word today. Yes. This is a strong word. And this is not in the notes. So God is just speaking this to us this morning. So the Lord says, I am doing the shaking. Yes. And then interesting, we get to about verse 8, and he says, by the way, folks, I'm your El Shaddai, Haggai 2.1. I'm your provider. Haggai 2.8, by the way, the silver's mine and the gold's mine. Amen. Oh, where'd it go? <laughs> Which means what? Oh, pastor's about to shift into a tithing message. No, he's not. <laughs> no, he's not. The Lord is saying, I'm your provider, and you're going to prosper even as your soul prospers. Hallelujah. Provision is more than just finance, although finance is very spiritual. Mm -hmm. And God wants to bless you. But the Lord wants to be your El Shaddai. The silver and gold is not your El Shaddai. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. He says, understand the difference between the blesser and the blessing and stop blurring the line. Ooh. Strong word today. That's for me too. Come on. Because the Lord says to remind us that he's the master and we're the steward. Amen. Amen. It's all his. So he says, I'm speaking to you. He says, I'm your El Shaddai. He said, I got it. Silver's mine, the gold's mine. I got it. That means all the silver and gold he wants to give you as well as all the silver and gold he already has, it's his. Yes. Hallelujah. He says, by the way, I'm going to shake everything that can be shaken until only that that cannot be shaken remains. What is that that cannot be shaken? That that's built on the firm foundation that is Jesus. And in the shaking, you are going to watch men scramble for a foundation. In the shaking, you're going to see the lost and the saved scrambling for a foundation. Because right now there's many in the church that aren't on the firm foundation even though they're sitting in the pew. Because their foundation is still shifting sands. It's not on the foundation that is Jesus. But right now, Jesus is releasing a greater drawing of Holy Spirit to draw people into the secret place. Yes. Yeah. Right now, if you're not a person of the secret place, you're not hearing the voice of God and obeying. Mm -hmm. 
Because right now God is drawing you into the secret place where he is going to bring you into a deeper place of intimacy with him and firm your foundation. Because the Lord is saying in the midst of the shaking, I don't want you to be shaken. Come on. The Lord says in the midst of the sifting, I don't want you to shift yourself. I want you to stand on the firm foundation and let me shift you because a God shift will always be so much better than a you shift. Oh, yeah. Hallelujah. The Lord says, I control the times and the seasons. Let me shift you. Wait upon me. Trust me. Stop trying to get out of this trial as quickly as you can. Wait and let me teach you in the midst of this trial things that you're going to use in the seasons to come and find that it was so beneficial. Yes, yes. Hallelujah. Yes. That's not an easy word. No. It's true. That's not an easy word. No, but the Lord says when the shaking starts, don't start blaming the enemy. The Lord's even going to shake the church. He has to. Yes. Because shaking begins first at the house of God. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Because the house of God is supposed to be then what God uses to influence every other pillar of society. Mm -hmm. So he's beginning a shaking in the house of God. And do not be shocked in the next year at the number of ministries that implode. Do not be surprised at the number of men of God exposed. Do not be surprised at the trees we thought were fruitful that Jesus curses and declares them barren. Mm -hmm. And don't blame the enemy because God is dealing with men walking in yesterday's anointing. God is dealing with ministers satisfied with yesterday's. God is dealing with the things that look fruitful to man but are barren to him and he is tearing them down and he'll build them back up again his way because unless the Lord builds the house they that build it labor in vain and don't be surprised if he doesn't do that very thing in your own life tear down structures that you have built up that he knows will not stand the shaking he'll implode them so you'll surrender them to him let them die so that he can build them back his way Hallelujah. Are you willing to let your dreams die so that I can take them and bring new life to them because you finally surrendered them to me? See, in this season, the Lord is so jealous for anything in your life that's more important than Him. And we make it subtle and we try to hide it and we try to spiritualize it. But so many of us have things in our lives that are more important than Jesus. And in the shaking, Jesus will reveal to you what's been more important to you than Him. As it's shaken away, are you going to grasp for it to try to grab it back? Or are you going to grasp the talit of Jesus' garment? Hallelujah. What are you going to grasp? It's good. That is going to reveal to you what your foundation is. Can I hear an amen? Amen. amen. All right. So there's a shifting of God that's going on right now. There's a sifting and there's a shifting. And I want us to see something in the Lord that's so important. Holy Spirit, we give this to you. I want you to listen to these words. A divine shift is a supernatural move of God that takes you from one place in the spirit to another, from one level to another, that changes your condition so he can change your position. It's the supernatural act of putting one thing in the place of another. Amen. And that's what God is doing in you right now. Don't be surprised if he isn't changing your affections. Is anybody here desiring some things less and other things more? Yeah. I'm hearing the Lord say things like less TV and more time in my presence. Mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. yes, amen. Does anybody hear this amen. in the Lord? Yeah. Once you notice this, during a divine shift, roadblocks that have existed for decades are moved in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Hallelujah. See, that's what's beginning to happen right now. 
governmental, state, regional, ministerial, and even personal divine shifts are beginning to take place rapidly. So is God shifting things away from you. Is happening rapidly if you're listening to His Spirit right now. Does anybody receive that in the Lord? Yeah. Amen. And there may be some foundations in your life right now that you thought were very firm that the Lord is going to show you were actually sand. You thought they were of Him, but they weren't. Yes. They were religious. They were personal. They were things that were generational. There's so many other things. And God is saying, Haggai chapter 2, verses 6 and 7, we're about to see governmental, state, regional, ministerial, even personal shifts going on all around us. But the Lord says, don't shift unless I'm shifting you. Don't move unless I'm moving you. Come on. Don't transition unless I'm transitioning you. The Lord says there's a difference between me transitioning you and you transitioning because you don't like the season that you're in any longer. The Lord says I see the end from the beginning. Stay in my seasons. Stay in my times. They are ordained mm -hmm. from the foundations of the earth. Yes. Does that make sense to anyone in the room? Yes. Come on. Yes, we've got to understand this in the Lord. And we've got to understand in the Lord that many times a shift is brought about by a harbinger. God will not let that word out of my spirit. I hear it day and night. Harbinger. Remember, we talked about that a couple weeks ago. Mm -hmm. yeah. I want you to notice something in the Lord. The arrival of a harbinger signals that a divine shift is coming in your life. Mm -hmm. You don't send the harbingers. God sends the harbingers. Has anybody received that in the Lord? Yes. What is a harbinger? This is crucial. A person or a thing that announces a shift or the arrival of a movement of God. And I want you to notice my very last point because Holy Spirit blew me out of my chair in the secret place yesterday when I heard Holy Spirit say this. A harbinger of revival is being released over this house. Amen. But wait a minute now. The harbinger is the sign. When John the Baptist showed on the scene, he was the harbinger announcing the arrival of Yeshua, of Messiah, of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Can I hear an amen? amen. Okay. Yeshua could not come forth until the forerunner, the harbinger, announced him. Yes. Come on. That's why John the Baptist's ministry came before Jesus' ministry. Even though they were born very close in time. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. That's why when Mary steps into the house where Elizabeth is pregnant and Mary is carrying Yeshua, is carrying the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth, John the Baptist leaps within Elizabeth's womb when Jesus comes in the room through Mama Mary. Why is that? Because he leapt with the joy of the harbinger. Now, I want you to grab a hold of this in the Lord because this is crucial. I heard God say, I am releasing the harbinger of revival over this house. Hallelujah. Yeah. Do you know what that means? Enjoy, go deep, get inundated in the river of revival that God is releasing for this house. But the revival is not just for this house. We're the harbinger. He's bringing it through. He's got to have a forerunner. Wow. He's got to have a forerunner. He's got to have a forerunner. We've got to understand this. It's Isaiah 42 9. Behold, the former things have come to pass, and the new things do I declare before they spring forth. I tell you of them. The harbinger tells you what is to come. See, John the Baptist comes on the scene. He was the harbinger, and he said, One is coming greater than I, whose sandals 
I'm not even worthy to untie. Mm -hmm. Come on. What is the harbinger of the river of revival in this house saying? That God is about to release the great end times revival. Yes. Yes. And we have the privilege of being a harbinger for him in this region. Yes. Yes. The harbinger is a servant. Yes. Being a harbinger is a servant role. Because God wants to release that revival all over this region. Yes. Well, what's special about us? Jesus. Amen. He's what's special. And we've said yes to him. But our yes has not only been for us, it's for everybody else in this region that's going to get touched by the river. Okay? And I want you to get a prophetic vision of this because without vision, the people perish. Dutch Sheets and some other prophets a number of years ago has traveled through every state in the Union and they prophesied over every single one of them. When they came to, the, to Illinois, Dutch Sheets cried out, Illinois, my apostolic state. Yeah. Wow. That message has burned in my heart since I heard it. And that's not even the full word, but that's the part that I just can't let go of. Mm -hmm. Illinois, my apostolic state, and the fivefold, the apostle, the prophet, the pastor, the teacher, the evangelist, the thumb can touch every other fold. Mm -hmm. The thumb raises up. The apostle raises up all the other folds. The apostle flows in all five mm -hmm. folds. Yes, you know what that tells me? We're the apostolic state. God's going to use the state of Illinois to birth things through that are going to touch the rest of the United States. Yeah. In Israel and the rest of the earth. And guess what? God birthed you in this Nazareth state in the Union. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? <laughs> God birthed you in this state because you're part of his apostolic movement. And I heard the Lord say very plainly in a service, Psalm 133, Ile Mato, blessed is the place where brothers dwell together in unity. It's like the oil on Aaron's starts on the, the head, right? Of a Aharon. We've got to understand that. The oil flowed from the horn down the head into the beard, mm -hmm. into the collar mm -hmm. of the robe. Mm -hmm. We've got to understand that. Think about a horn full of oil being poured on the head. Mm -hmm. It flows down. Mm -hmm. It flows down. Are you hearing this? Yes. So if, we, if the state of Illinois is the apostolic state, the Rock River Valley region is the crown on the head of the apostolic state. And the oil is going to flow down the head of the harbinger mm -hmm. in the beard, in the collar of its robes from this region all the way down to Cairo and Marion and Carbondale. All the way over to Springfield and Bloomington Normal. All the way over to Quincy, Illinois. The oil is going to flow down. And as the oil saturates the apostolic state, that oil is going to go throughout yes. the United States, Israel, Jamaica, mm -hmm. Haiti, yes. and the earth. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes. We have a choice, refuge. Mm -hmm. We can see ourselves as a little church on a little road in a little village mm -hmm. away outside of a very big city, yes. Chicago. Or we can see ourselves as a harbinger for the Lord. Hallelujah. That God is going to use to anoint, to announce and release a great move of God. Hallelujah. Pastor, where do you get that from? He used the simple things in the world to confound yes. the lies. Yes. The weak things to confound the strong. Yes. For the, ra the battle is not to the strong, nor the race to the swift. Mm -hmm. Has anybody received that in the Lord? Yeah. The race is not for the swift, the battle not for the strong. Do not despise the day of humble beginnings because I use little shepherd boys to kill giants and shift battles. Hey! So we've got to understand 
This was a house of David's. Yeah. <laughs> and God's going to use us for great things. The enemy would love to say, well, why are you praying? And why are you doing this? And what's really happening here? Mm -hmm. You know, and then what's really being influenced? And what's really changing? You know what? He wouldn't bother speaking all that if he wasn't worried about what God's going to do. Amen. Does anybody receive that in the Lord? Yes. Now, that's corporately. The enemy speaking the same thing over your life because the enemy knows that God wants to use you in a mighty way. Mm -hmm. What's going on right now in you? What's going on in your marriage? What's going on in your household? What's going on in your family? What's going on? What's going on? What's going on? There's a whole lot going on. That's why he's asking what's going on. Because the opposite of what he says is true. So when he asks what's going on from the throne of God, God is saying there's a whole lot going on right now. Hallelujah. But you got to choose to be a part of it. See, we're part of the fulfillment of Isaiah 42 9 because God saw the timeline before I was ever born. God saw the timeline when my great 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 grandfather Shambach got in the field on his knees and asked Jesus into his heart as a farmer and became a circuit riding preacher. And God started something in my family. It was way before that. I'm a descendant of German Jews that escaped from. From uh, Germany as Hitler was taking over. God saw before that. Mm -hmm. See, he sees down the timeline. And he releases things strategically. Yes, Come on. Yeah. And we're coming into a strategic releasing of the Lord. And if God had a plan for me like that, and God has you here in this body, then you're a part of that plan also. Hallelujah. See, God is always birthing the answer before the darkness ever comes that causes us to say, what's the answer to this? And then God releases that answer in a strategic time. So I want you to let Isaiah 42, 9 burn on your heart. Behold, the former things are come to pass. All the, all the junk is done, folks. The former things are behind you. And God says over your life, I'm declaring new things now. Your mistakes, your failures, divorces, blowing it, messing up, things that you did that you can't forgive yourself for. God says, look, they're behind you now. Yes. Yes. I call them, the Lord Jesus says, I call them the former things. If you've confessed them, I'm faithful and just to forgive you of them and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness when you're walking in the spirit and not the flesh. See, we've got to understand the heart of God. He shed his blood for every sin that we'd ever commit. Now, that's not a get out of jail free card. We need to walk in the fear of the Lord. But we need to understand the Lord is saying, the former things are behind you you and the new things yeah. I declare before they spring forth I tell them to you and right now God is speaking to the prophets and he's telling them what's coming yeah. Yeah. and we're seeing prophetic words that were spoken over this house a decade ago starting to come into fruition yeah. Pastor Cindy shaking his head we're beginning to see the river flow over what was once a dry place. Yeah. We're beginning to see the flowers bloom in one, what was once desert-like. Yeah. Think about it now. This building that we're in has been everything from a carpet store, yeah. come on now, to a coin shop, to a fundraising center. And now the river flows right in the middle of where all the merchandise was. Behind this, this wall, for some reason, on the back wall, is all kinds of crutches and wheelchairs and all kinds of things. We were praying back in that area the other day, and Thursday night, the Lord said, that's a forerunner sign that people are going to come in in wheelchairs and walkers and caves, but they're going to leave healed and deliver and restore, and they're going to start collecting them back there. Yeah. <laughs> study Zion, Illinois and it's founding by Alexander Dowie in his tabernacle where the walls were covered with crutches and walkers because people left them there when they got touched by God and they never needed them again that was a harbinger move of God can I hear an amen? amen. amen. so church I'm here to say that there's a shifting that's going and God says, you're a part of that shift. And he says, I want you to get your theology in alignment with my theology in this day. 
That's what the Lord is saying. Okay? I want us to understand that. You know, God never let me go to seminary. <laughs> and I'll tell you why. Because I wouldn't have fit in. <laughs> because seminary is going to want to talk about covenant theology and dispensational theology and Christ-centric theology. This is my theology. Jesus is the Son of God. He died and He rose again and He's seated at the right hand of the Father and He's coming back again soon as the conquering King. Yes. Yes. Amen. Hallelujah. Does that make sense? Yes. But we've got to understand God can do anything any way He wants to. Yes. That's why God is saying to denominations right now, I want you to throw down your denominational thinking yes. and I want to unlearn some things from you and I want to teach you these things my way because pulpits have released man's teaching for generations now we're about to see some of the most anointed Holy Ghost led teachings come forth from the word of God in this generation that have ever been released in any other generation other than out of the mouth of mouth of Jesus and he is going to give us the treasures Hidden in the dark places. Oh, yes. He's revealing things that have never been revealed before. Can I hear an amen? amen? You know, it's interesting with theology. The covenant folks say God does everything through covenants. The dispensational folks say God does everything through dispensations of time. The Christ-centric folks say, you know what? Father does everything through Christ his Son. You know what my thought is on this? God's going to do it the way God wants to do it. We need to get in alignment with the way God wants to do it. And you know what? He does it through the covenant. He does it through dispensations. He does it through Jesus. He does it any way that he wants to do it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But we've got to understand God ordains the times and the seasons. Is anybody receiving this in the Lord? Amen. I want you to see something. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. How many are in love with the Lord and how many are enjoying this word? Hallelujah. I want you to see something. God messed me up with this. God has me read through the word, Genesis to Revelation, over and over again in cycles of one to two years. We're getting closer to one. God said, I want you to do this until I return. Do you know, every time I read the word, he shows me something different than what I've ever seen before. Yes. Yes. Has anybody received that in the Lord? Yes. Okay, I, I want us to get this in the Lord. So Ephesians chapter 1, and we're going to look at verses 9 and 10. And he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times will have reached their fulfillment. When the what reaches its fulfillment? Amen. The times. He is the God of the appointed time. Can I hear an amen? amen. So somebody say times. Amen. He has appointed times and seasons for everything. Mm -hmm. Now with that, some of the theological folks would say, okay, Pastor, now you're getting into dispensation. No, I'm getting into the fact that God controls the times and the seasons. He does it corporately. He does it individually. God's in control of the times and seasons of this house, and God's in control of the times and seasons of your life. Does, does anybody Amen. receive that in the Lord? Amen. 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 To be put into effect when the times will have reached their fulfillment or fullness... In the Koine Greek, to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. Which means what? Every dispensation of time from Genesis to this point has had one purpose to begin to bring everything into fulfillment under one head, the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Come on. And this is all going to culminate with the Lord coming back for his church, the millennial reign. I mean, come on, the new heaven and the new earth. We've got to understand this. Now, folks may not always be in agreement with timing, but I think we need to be in agreement that the Lord's coming back soon. Yes. Can I hear an amen? amen? And we need to be ready. Can I hear an amen? amen? Now, I want you to notice something if you're still in Ephesians 1. Notice verse 4. 
for he chose us in him before the, cre the creation of the world. <laughs> Do you know when you asked Jesus in your heart, you didn't just decide one day that you needed a savior. Do you know what you did? You responded to his choosing. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. And he chose you in eons of time past. Which means your life is not a happenstance or the occurrence of mom and dad having a little romance and candlelight dinner and then here you came. Jesus planned you for this dispensation of time. Mm -hmm. He could have birthed you anywhere from Genesis to now. Mm -hmm. He birthed you for the end times. Yes. Meaning what? He knew as he fashioned you together in the secret place before he put you in your mother's womb, yeah. that he put within you the strength, the courage, the power, the anointing to stand in this hour and fulfill your purpose. Yeah. Do you receive it? Yes. He saved you for the last leg of the race. The leg of the race where the person that is the coach of the running team saves his strongest runner for so you are purposely birthed for this point in history. Esther 4.14, for such a time as this. Can I hear an amen? Amen. amen. Anybody receive that in the Lord? Yes. Yes. Dispensations of time. It's very interesting as we look throughout history, there's dispensations of God's time. This is fascinating. There's Adam to Noah. That was the time of innocence. Noah to Abraham, the time of the promise. Abraham to Moses, the time of the covenant. Moses to John the Baptist, the time of the law. John the Baptist to the present age, the dispensation of grace. How many are so glad we're born in the, the time of the dispensation of grace? Amen. 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 At the church age. Hallelujah. But I want you to notice this. Ephesians chapter 1. Verses 9 and 10, the fullness of time is coming. What do I mean by that? The fulfillment of time. God declares the beginning of the season and the end of the season, and he's in control of everything that goes on during the season, but there's only so many seasons he's ordained to be. We're coming in the fullness of time with the Gentiles. We're coming in the time, mark these words because this is prophetic. We are coming in the time of the release of the great end times revival and great awakening. Where we are going to see a major revival go throughout the earth. And people get saved like we've never seen before. Is anybody excited? Yes. We're going to see Israel fulfill Zechariah 12.10. And they'll look upon him whom they pierced and recognize him and long for him is what longs for an only son. And then the Jews and Gentiles will come together and the Jews will say to the Gentiles, let us teach you things about our Jewish king that you never knew before. Incredible things are going to happen. But then the Lord's going to come for his yeah. church. Now you may debate on what that timeline looks like, but none of us should debate he's coming back. Yes. Can I hear an amen? Amen. amen? But then that's going to bring the dispensation of judgment. And the earth is going to be judged. Yes. See, the great revival is God crying out to the earth and saying, I desire that all men would be saved and to come into a knowledge of truth. And until that time has come where I know through the will of the Father that I'm to return, I want everyone to be saved that can be saved. Which means what? There's going to be such an anointing for evangelism that's going to be poured out like we've never seen before. Amen. Come on. Hallelujah. And I believe even the believer that says, well, I'm just not real comfortable sharing Jesus with people. An anointing of prophetic evangelism is going to come over you and you're not going to be able to keep your mouth shut. You're going to see that person at Walmart going to grab a bottle of tequila and the Spirit of God is going to say to you, go tell them they don't need it. I've heard their prayer. I heard them cry for deliverance from addiction to alcohol. And the time is now. Bam! And they're going to go down in the Spirit and get saved, free, healed, Holy Ghost filled, and delivered right in the liquor aisle at Walmart. 
And then the world and even the church is going to have to admit that we don't serve a politically correct Jesus. We don't serve a Jesus who believes in tolerance. We don't serve an effeminate Jesus that is just kind of looking at the earth right now and going, well, you know, y'all really need to get saved. <laughs> We've got a fierce coming king yes. who is going to come and judge the earth in righteousness. Come on. And that coexist bumper sticker that makes me want to up chuck every single time I see it that has all of these symbols on it and the cross. I get angry every time I see it. Because Jesus is either completely the truth or absolutely a liar. Because he said, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. And nobody comes to the Father yes. but by me. He said, I'm the only door, the only gate, the only shepherd. There's no tolerance in the message of Jesus. He says, it's my way or the hell way. That's what he says. And we painted him to be politically correct. And there's nothing politically correct about him coming back on a white horse with a name on his thigh only he knows. And a double-edged sword in his mouth and, 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 a, and a crown on his head. Fierce and mighty. And all the earth will see him to come back as the conquering king. We need to quit painting him as the, the baby in the manger and realize that in the dispensation of time, he's the conquering king now sitting on the throne ready to come back to avenge those that he loves. Come on. Somebody receive that in the Lord? Somebody say, bless the name of the Lord in this place. Shiftings. 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 I want you to think about something now. We paint Jesus to be so politically correct when he's a fierce, mighty warrior God. In a passage in the Old Testament, the word says, and the roar of the king was heard from the camp of the Israelites. You know who's roaring? The lion with the crown on his head. <laughs> And he was roaring like the conquering king before he ever came for his earthly ministry. Hallelujah. Come on. Our, the, the word says our God is a mighty warrior. Yes. Yes. And in more than once in Israel's history, he strapped on the sword and he himself went out yes. and dealt with the enemy. Mm -hmm. The angel of the Lord. Our Jesus is fierce. Yes. There's nothing effeminate about him. And when we stand before the Lord and we look into the eyes of fire, there'll be no excuses and nobody will be able to say, well, I don't believe that way. Yeah. There'll be no room to explain our own personal theology. All that's going to stand is what is alignment with his word. Yes. Yes. Why? Because heaven and earth will pass away, but the word of God will endure forever. Come on. So we've got to understand something. All over the word, we see God bringing people into uncomfortable new beginnings. Who in the world taught us that new beginnings are joyous all the time? Fun all the time. Incredible all the time. Woohoo! All the time. Who taught us that? Where did that come from? God comes to Abraham and says, get out of your father's land. Get out of your father's false temple. Get out away from your family and go to the middle of nowhere where nobody knows you. And I'm going to make a mighty nation out of you. Huh? Exactly. What? What about God who wanted to make a new beginning and he got so fed up tolerating the wickedness of man that he put eight souls in an ark and preserved only those eight lives. But you know, you study what God did up to the flood. God birthed a man by the name of Methuselah and then it will come in the Hebrew is what his name means. And you study what happened to all these men and women of God before the flood. God took them all to paradise prior to releasing the flood. See, he always preserves his remnant. Then he put eight in the ark, the, the Hebrew number of new beginnings, and he violently flooded the earth and he started things over. Why do we think that new seasons always start easily? Come on. 
He's the God who opens barren wombs. He's the God who brings life to broken dreams. He's the God who raises the dead to life. He's the God who sacrifices himself for the sake of his own bride. Hallelujah. And yet we think we can fit him in this little box. And that he's going to do things the way that we think he should do them. You know, there's a major shift from Egypt back into Israel. There's a major shift from Babylon back into Israel. There was a major shift from John the Baptist to Jesus. There's a major shifting from Jesus' crucifixion to his resurrection. And I think the most major shift is upon us right now. It's the shift into the end times and the returning of our king. This is why you're here. He birthed you for his last major shift. Yes. And you know what you're here to do? You're here to preach the gospel to all creation. Yes. You're here to heal the sick, raise the dead, and cast out demons. Yes. You're here to do greater things than what Jesus did. You're here for your greatest hour of fulfillment. And don't you dare think, that your greatest hour of fulfillment is based upon whether or not your hair is dark or gray. <laughs> because I see mature silver hair or those covering the silver haired saints of God ready, seasoned, and primed for their greatest moments. So stop thinking you're going to retire down to Florida. Just stop. <laughs> you're called to this region. You're going to retire at the wedding feast of the Lamb. When you raise the cup and say, Worthy is the Lamb to receive all glory, all honor, all power, all praise, all dominion. Then you can retire to your beach house. <laughs> but I still think you're going to want to be in the throne room a whole lot more than the beach house. And I hear an amen. amen. So let me say this in the Lord. Right now, a great shift is upon us. Yes. The harbinger of revival has been released in this house. Yes. Well, Pastor, how's it the harbinger of revival? I mean, is it, is it Azusa Street already? Or is it like Toronto or Pensacola or Brownsville? They all started with the water beginning to trickle. Yes. And then God opened up the faucet and whoosh! You know what God's teaching us right now? How to live in the river. God's preparing us to be carriers of the river. That's why every time we come together, God is teaching us. So we wrap up with the final song that we did twice. And there's a time of silence. It would have been easy for me to go, all right, folks, let's let's transition off the prayer carpet mm -hmm. and, and, and let's take our seats and it's time for the word. Mm -hmm. I just got on my face before the Lord. I heard Holy Spirit say, wait. Mm -hmm. God starts releasing prophetic words. Mm -hmm. Wait. Yes. <laughs> and we could feel in the spirit when the current mm -hmm. shifted. Mm -hmm. yes. And then it was time to come back. See, he's the God that controls the times yes. and the seasons, even in our service. He's teaching us now how to be able to follow him mm -hmm. in the river. Yes. Come on. Amen. Yes. Now, I remember as a kid, we used to swim in the Mississippi. Here's Missouri again. <laughs> we would swim in the Mississippi and they'd take us out to a sandbar. You had to be careful on a sandbar because the current could shift and the whole sandbar goes. Mm -hmm. I mean, you had to be real careful on sandbar. Uh, but they would mark out with big, very big sticks where the kids could swim. And so we'd swim in this area, but you'd always long for the deeper waters. <laughs> and so I remember my dad would go out beyond the sticks and I'd cry out, Dad, I want to go deeper. <laughs> and Dad would motion me. And I remember a time where I was so deep, I, I couldn't touch the bottom. And Dad grabs me as I go to fidget a little bit. I'm scared. See, I knew when Dad was in the deeper waters, I could go in the deeper waters. Yes. See, we're learning in the river to look to see where Jesus is. And we're going to follow the Lamb of God wherever he goes. Amen. Amen. And we may be right in the middle of worship, enjoying worship, and somebody looks out prophetically and, oh, Jesus is deeper. Mm -hmm. 
He's gone out deeper. Okay, let's go. <laughs> and we all go together into the deeper water. Yes. Do you know what that means? God's teaching us how to be as one. Mm -hmm. yes. When it comes to praise, yes. worship, yes. the word. No longer will somebody's shallow, somebody's deep, somebody's in between, somebody's watching from the shore, somebody's warming themselves from the fire up on the hill. No, no, no. God's teaching us how to move together as one body. You see, if I want to go deeper in the water, I move my foot, but all the rest of me is connected to that foot. Yes. The head, the head can't go, well, I'm going to stay back here. <laughs> We can't do this. See, we're learning. Okay, Jesus is in the, in the deeper waters. Come on! Come on! And we all go deeper. Okay, Jesus, stop moving. Okay, stop. Stop, stop. stop. Okay, now Jesus moved over here towards the shore, still in the water. Okay, let's go over here. It's learning to follow him. It seems so easy in theory, but yet we complicate it so much because we're so cerebral. Mm -hmm. Well, how do I know if he's deeper in the water? Well, how do I know? How do I know? How do I know? How do I know? Oh, we don't go by that. We go by what we feel in the spirit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Come on. Who knows the, the mind, the heart, the movement of God, but the spirit of God. So if we connect with Holy Spirit, we can know the mind, the heart, and the movement of God. Yes. But it's disconnecting from the cerebral. Mm -hmm. Come on. You know, they've done studies on speaking in tongues with brain waves. And when somebody has a conversation like this, the brain waves move. But when somebody, the brain movement stops. Yes. Which means when you go from speaking in the natural to speaking in tongues, you're shifting. Yes. Yeah. Come on. From the soul to the spirit. Yes. Somebody get this? Yes. Oh, I've got a word from the Lord for you. He wants to teach you how to shift from the soul to the spirit. Yes. The soul is the mind, the will, the emotions. Mm -hmm. I don't feel it. I don't understand. I don't get it. I don't see it happening. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't. Yes. To just get in the realm of the spirit where we flow. Those who are of the spirit are like the wind. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. See, it's, it's a whole new way of thinking that God wants to teach us. And he's offering this right now to every church. Yes. And some are going to say we'd rather have what we've already got. If you always do what you've always done, you're always going to get what you already got. Mm -hmm. I'm just, we're happy with Mary. Ooh. Ouch. We're happy with our denomination. Mm -hmm. That doesn't fit our theology. That can disrupt our service. We'd lose control. You know what? Let's lose control. Yeah. So let's get God control. Because I don't want to stand in front of Jesus as a religious man. I want to stand in front of Jesus completely surrendered, sold out, flowing in the Holy Ghost, and still dripping from the river. Come on. Look just like him. Yes. Amen, yes. sister? Yes. Daughter? Yes. Yes. Isn't it good to have daughter in the house today? Yes. Going yes. through some stuff that God's moving in her life? Yes. Yes. Can I hear it, amen? amen? So guys, right now, there's a harbinger that's showing up. Is it the harbinger of the final shift? I very well think it might be. But here's the thing. <laughs> Do you know if you're running from a forest fire, that's burning all around you and you see a river, when you get in the river, you're safe. Mm -hmm. yes. Doesn't matter what's going on on the banks. Mm -hmm. What only matters is that you're safe in the river. Yes. I believe we're about to see political, economical, national, multinational shifts and challenges. Mm -hmm. Stay in the river. Yes. Because I believe we're going to have some of our most amazing experiences with God corporately and personally in the river during difficult times. Mm -hmm. what, did, what did God say to Daniel? In the midst of the thick darkness, there's going to be a people who know their God and they're going to do mighty exploits. Do you receive that in the Lord? Yes. So I think we may have to become like Smith Wigglesworth. I was reading about Wigglesworth one day. He was uh, an elderly man at the time, and a young preacher came over to be mentored by him. 
and the preacher came in carrying a newspaper. Oh, yeah. And Wigglesworth looked at him and said, what's that? He said, it's a newspaper. He said, get that out of my house. Yes. I don't want to know what's going on right now. All I want to know is what God is saying from the throne. Yes. Well, pastor, that doesn't sound very balanced to me. God's version of balance is going to look unbalanced yes. to everybody around you. Yes. Even your family stopped looking up to them for approval because even Jesus' earthly family didn't approve. Right. And didn't get it really till after he rose again. Does that make sense? Yes. Hey, Jesus, your family's outside. They're coming to get you. They think you're crazy. <laughs> who is my family? The ones who do my will. They're my family. Well, Lord, let me go bury my mother and my father, and then I'll come and follow you. Let the dead bury the dead. Amen. Come, mm -hmm. follow me. Mm -hmm. but, but Lord, let me take care of all my wealth and, and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. Give it all away to the poor. Come, mm -hmm. follow me. Mm -hmm. See, he's not a God of excuses. Amen. Mm -hmm. Right? He's a God of surrender. Yes. And we've got to understand this about him. Can I hear an amen? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I believe in the Lord. There's a final shift coming. And I've got a question to you for you because it says in Matthew 24 37 that when the Lord comes back it's going to be as the days of Noah yeah. is it not like the days of Noah all around us right now yes. I mean come on we just start naming things that are going on that would get me shut off from Facebook like this if my coexist comment didn't already make it happen yeah. okay We've got to understand right now, we're in the midst of a shift. What is a sign that we are coming into the final shift? I want you to see this, Revelation 9.21. I'm a person who likes the signs. How many know that Jesus said to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, you understand what, this, what the weather is going to be like the night before by looking at the sky, but you don't understand the signs of the times. What is going to be a sign for us that we're coming into the final shift? Mm -hmm. Revelation 9.21. How many are in love with the Lord? Yes. Amen. Okay. Notice what the Lord says. Nor did they repent of their murders, their magic arts, their sexual immorality, or their thefts. Woo! Three times in the book of Revelation, the word says, God tried to get their attention but they would not repent. God tried to get their attention, but they would not repent. Mm -hmm. God tried to get their attention, but they would not repent. Mm -hmm. And major things are happening. People are dying. There's plagues. But men still embrace wickedness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I believe a, a sign is going to be that we're in the final shift when men won't repent any longer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And folks, I believe... We're getting there yes. to that place where people are going to be unwilling to repent, even in the church. Yes, yes. How many are willing to receive this in the Lord? Yes. We're already getting to the point where hearts are so hardened. Anybody willing to receive this? Yes. Where hearts are so hardened that even in the church, Jesus is walking through. And Jesus is saying, hmm, do me a favor, Rosie. Hit B on the keyboard, please. Even now we're getting to the point where Jesus is walking through church services and he's saying, let me shift you into the river. And men are going, no, we want our three songs and our offering and our two songs. And we want to be out in order to get to a restaurant before it gets too busy. Mm -hmm. My brother ministered in a seeker sensitive church for seven years. I won't say the name of it. But that seeker sensitive church was once, was once an assembly of God church that moved into things of the Spirit and love the river, but they decided one day that didn't bring in enough people, so they shifted to being seeker-sensitive. They went from a very hungry, wet group like ours because they loved the river to having fourteen to 1,500 people a weekend show up. Seeker. 
I asked him, I said, what goes on in this group? He says, we turn them over every six months. I said, how does that work? He said, they come, they get saved, and then they realize the waters are shallow and they leave. But he said, you know, we understand. That's, that's who we are. Well, I knew a prophetic man who was a part of that church. And he said, after they shifted and all the people started coming, he said, there was a service where during praise and worship, the Spirit of God began to move like days of old. But they got to the fourth planned song of worship and they shut the door. And they went into the Word. He said he was shocked as the pastor started preaching. He looked up and at the back of the altar was Jesus crying. See, we're coming to the day and age where people in the church aren't going to repent and want to change unless they're part of the remnant. Where people in the world aren't going to want to repent and change. We're getting to the point now where, where men would rather embrace their sin than the truth of who Jesus is. We are in the midst of that shift beginning to happen. Does anybody receive this? Yes. I mean, we've got to understand this. I have shared the gospel with people not that long ago to, to have them say to me, you know what, that really makes sense and I believe what you're saying, but I don't want to give this up. That's a refusal to repent. And now the church and the world are beginning to flaunt their sin as if Jesus is turning a blind eye to it. How many know we're coming into the final shift? Yeah. So what do we need to do to survive in this final shift? And I'm going to wrap up with this. Rosie, if you want to hit B again for me, please. Thank you. Three things that I want to put in front of you that we need to begin to do. Number one, we've got to have an intimate prayer life with the Lord. We need intimacy with Jesus so that we know his will and his voice in the hour that we're coming into. What in your life is hindering you right now from intimacy with Jesus? Is it TV? Is it another lover? Is it pursuing money? Is it pursuing sex? Is it pursuing fill in the blank? Or is it you just really enjoying your own leisure time? Whatever that is, it's an idol, no matter how we dress it up. It's an idol. Mm -hmm. And it's ugly to the Lord. Oh. Somebody receive that? Yes. It's interesting in Revelation eleven twenty, the rest of mankind that were not killed by these plagues still did not repent of the work of their hands. They did not stop worshiping demons, idols of gold, silver, bronze, stone, and wood, idols that cannot see or hear or walk. That's not about a thousand years ago in Israel. Mm -hmm. That's about the end of the age. Mm -hmm. They worship the gods of their hands. They worship demons. They worship themselves. They were lovers of pleasure instead of lovers of God. They lost their natural affections mm -hmm. and turned their affections into blasphemies and abominations before the Lord. So God gave them over to a reprobate mind, Romans 1. How are we going to fight that church? Because we're going to be surrounded by it like Daniel in Babylon. Mm -hmm. How can Daniel stay pure and holy before the Lord in Babylon? Let me tell you how. He can do it by praying morning, noon, and night. Yes. Come on. Mm -hmm. Come on. So we're going to need an intimate relationship with Jesus that manifests in a deep prayer life so we can know his Lord. Secondly, one of the most important spiritual gifts for the church to walk in at the end of the age is discernment. Mm -hmm. Because we're going to need to know what's of God and what's not of God. We're going to need to recognize what spirits are of him and what are not. Because, you know, there's a false prophet that's going to be raised up. There's going to be many saying that they're Jesus. These folks are going to flow in the supernatural, but not the right supernatural. And they're going to do false signs, false wonders, false miracles. And many are going to be deceived. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. That's why the Lord says, if they say, he's here. He's ministering. Jesus is ministering over here. Jesus is ministering over there. He said, if you didn't see me come through the clouds, it's not me. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. 
And right now, I can start talking about different places, even in our nation, where there's men who have risen up and called themselves Jesus, and they have followers. Mm -hmm. There's a guy down in Florida right now that's doing this. Mm -hmm. It just amazes me, and some people in this group are church people. Mm -hmm. We're church people. We're going to see an increase of cults. We're going to see an increase of groups that twist the gospel. We better know the word. When certain groups right now knock on your door and they say, do you believe that God created us to rule and reign? You better know what the word says. Mm -hmm. And the word doesn't say in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was a God, as they try to tell you. Mm -hmm. My Bible says in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt amongst them. John 1.13. Can I hear it? Amen. Amen. So we're going to need to discern because there's going to be a whole lot of people that look like they have good fruit on the tree but it's not good fruit on the tree. It just looks good. Mm -hmm. And a tree is going to be known by its fruit and we better know the fruit. We need discernment. And then thirdly, what are we going to need? We're going to... And this is for some maybe in here right now. And understanding that all circumstances in our lives are in God's hands. And He works all things together yes. for good yes. in our lives. Yes. Amen. Amen. You know, I read in Matthew 24 where the Word says that the love of many is going to wax cold and they're going to fall away. Even some of the elect are going to be deceived. And I've gotten on my face before the Holy Spirit and I've cried out, How? How can that happen, God? You know what the Lord said? They got offended because things didn't happen the way they thought they would. And they got offended with me. And I heard the Holy Spirit quote out of the Gospels where Jesus looks at the disciples after everyone has gotten offended with him because he starts preaching the cross. And he says, blessed is the man who's not offended on my account. See, Jesus is going to do some things coming up here that you might find a little offensive if you don't really understand the word of God and what his agenda is. Come on. And we're going to go through things. I think the American church is going to know some persecution. Do I think the Lord's going to take us out before we ever really have to go through things? I don't really think he's going to. My Bible says those who endure until the end are going to receive the crown of life. Yes. Okay. Now, I'm not saying that we're, we're going to go through all seven years, but what I'm saying is we're going to go through some things. Mm-hmm. Yes. And we better let God prepare our hearts for that right now. Yeah. And sometimes in the intimate place and the secret place, God begins to share things with you that are difficult, but he does it to prepare you for what is to come. Yes. Come on. Yeah. Behold, I'm doing a new thing. I declare it before I bring it forth. Sometimes the things that he declares are difficult. He may say to you, you know, you're going to go through some difficult things and and folks are going to turn on you that you really love. What? 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 This can't be God. Yeah, it is God. And he's he's letting you know it's coming, so get your heart ready. Get your heart ready. I've had God say to me before, okay, Andrew, I want you to say this, but by the way, when you say it, people aren't going to understand and some are going to get upset. Oh. Okay. (laughs) Here we go. But you see, God's preparing my heart. And he's really saying, Andrew, I want you to say this. And you're not responsible for how it's received. You're only responsible to be obedient and say it. Don't let your heart be wounded by how the response comes. See, when I'm intimate with Jesus and my heart is hidden with him, even when an arrow strikes my heart, I won't become bitter and offended and upset. Not only with the person who shot it, but also with Jesus, who I thought should have shielded my heart. Because we're going to go through some things, and if we're not careful, we're going to get upset with Jesus. But if we understand like Paul, and I've been lashed with 39 lashes, 40 minus 1, three times for the sake of Christ, and I rejoice! Hallelujah. What? How many of us are going to be lashed 39 times and walk away going, I got to suffer for the sake of Jesus? <laughs> and how many are going to go, Where was he? He got stopped every one of those lashes. Where was he? 
and offended. Same event, two responses. We've got to become intimate with him so our responses are in alignment with him, not the circumstances. Mm -hmm. Right. Come on. What's going to happen if we pray and pray and pray and fast and fast and pray for something that doesn't happen? Or something happens even though we've done that that we didn't expect. Are we going to trust God? Are we going to love God? Are we going to believe God is sovereign? Are we going to believe that his ways are higher than our ways? Are we in this thing? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To the very end? Amen. How many are willing to receive this word in the Lord? Amen. 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 You know, I, I heard the Lord say the other day, he said, Andrew, you need to be in this to the end. I've got a word for you right now. You need to be in this to the end. Yes. Which means what? Yes. No exit, no plan B. Mm -hmm. I had an intimate time with the Lord yesterday. Not yesterday, it was Thursday. I had a bathroom encounter with God. Love those. Yeah. Love those. I asked God once, why do we have bathroom encounters? He said, because you're quiet and you're focused. Okay. <laughs> I'm not trying to be facetious, God said. There's a lot of truth in that, right? Okay. right. speak to me on the riding lawnmower too, and it's the same thing, right? I just had a very intimate moment with Jesus, and I didn't even tell my wife this, so she's going to hear this along with you, but I sat in an intimate moment with Jesus because that's when I heard Holy Spirit say, Andrew, you want to be this, be in this to the end. So I said, Lord, okay. You know all things, and if I'm not going to make it until you return in the clouds for the church, if you know I'm going to go out before that, Lord, I want to go out as a martyr for you. Yeah. Because I want to step into eternity as a martyr for your sake. Oh, and I heard Holy, I felt Holy Spirit receive that, but then I heard Holy Spirit say, but are you willing to be a living martyr for yeah. me? <laughs> you know, the shot from a gun is a lot easier than years of living as a martyr. Mm -hmm. That's right. It's a moment versus long seasons. Mm -hmm. And I knew the moment Holy Spirit said that, it, it wasn't a dig. It was Holy Spirit wanting me to question my own heart and motives and thoughts. Mm -hmm. yeah. I love it when God does that, and it's difficult when God does that. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen? But you know what the Lord is saying to us in this generation? If you can take it, you can make it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yes. And right now, he's teaching us how to be strong. Yes. There's some in this building right now that are waiting on God for physical healing. Is he not El Shaddai? Yes. Is he not Jehovah Rapha? Mm -hmm. Then why don't we have it yet? Maybe yes. he's teaching us how to be strong yes. and how to push through. Mm -hmm. yes. Will I come to Thursday night intercession when I'm not feeling incredible? Will I come to Sunday morning when I woke up with that issue again? Come on. Come on. Yeah. Because tougher things than that are coming, folks. Yes. <laughs> but he's teaching us how to stand right now, and he's El Shaddai no matter when the healing comes. Yes. Yes. Come on. Yes. He's Jehovah Rapha no matter when Leo sees the healing in his physical body. Yes. He's still Jehovah Rapha. Yes. And he's sovereign, and he's going to do it his way. Yes. You know what the Lord is doing right now? We're in the river, but the river doesn't feel like what the river felt like when we were in praise and worship. <laughs> right now, we're in the place of the river where, where God is flowing the, the river over our hearts. Mm -hmm. And he's saying, right now, I want you to look at what's inside your heart. Are there any areas of your heart that I'm calling you to repent over? Are there any areas of your heart that are stony and stubborn? Is there anything in you that if you don't let me deal with it, it's going to cause you to be counted amongst those in Matthew 24? He says, I want to deal with it now. He says, don't have the attitude that will deal with it when I'm face to face with it. He says, I want to deal with it now. I want to take the stones 
out of the river so it can flow. So I want us to do this. I want us to just close our eyes for a moment. And before we take communion, God wants to speak to our hearts. And I don't care if you're the, the youngest in the room. That's probably Pat at 10. Or if you're the most senior in this room. Which is probably Brother Gordon. Or anywhere in between. God's asking you the same question right now. Will you open up your heart and let me reveal to you what's inside? Because I'm shifting. I'm sifting. I'm shaking. I'm bringing things down to the base level. So I can build them up my way. Are you willing in your heart to be sifted? Are you willing in your heart to give up that lover? Are you willing to change? Are you willing to give me this area that I've been asking you for? Knowing that if you don't give it to me, this is going to be a real issue down the road. And it could affect a whole lot of things. And a whole lot of people that I want you to minister to. Do you know, many times revival comes on the heels of repentance. Azusa Street Revival in 1906 came to Los Angeles, California because in late 1905 an earthquake leveled San Francisco and they were so afraid the judgment of God was going to hit Los Angeles next that people started repenting all over Los Angeles. And guess what happened? The repentance was the harbinger that brought the Azusa Street Revival. Will repentance be the harbinger that brings a greater move of God in your life in this season than you've ever had before? I will, break up my fellow will repentance be the harbinger? So I want to encourage you right now. Let the Holy Spirit speak to you about your heart. Well, Pastor, we're all saved here. We're all believers here. Yeah, but we've all got hearts and we all need to surrender. You know, I'll be honest, within the last year, I got a prophetic word. Andrew, there's a chamber of your heart that you're standing in front of with your arms crossed and you won't let Holy Spirit go in there. My initial response or initial thought was, I've surrendered my heart to God. And as I thought it, I heard Holy Spirit say, not that part. <laughs> well, what God, what's in there? You know. Uh-oh. Okay, Holy Spirit, take me by the hand. Let's go in that room. Mm -hmm. And let's deal with it. Mm -hmm. That was a harbinger word in my life. Mm -hmm. See, sometimes a difficult prophetic word is a harbinger. Yes. If you'll respond to it and let God move, it's going to bring a shift in your life. But if you don't respond to it and let God move, then you're going to stay stuck. Mm -hmm. And the Lord says, I don't want any of my people to be stuck in this hour. That's right. But I want to lift my people's feet out of the miry clay. And I want to put them on a firm foundation yes. to stay. See, that's what God's saying. <laughs> Holy Spirit. It's so easy to love you when we're in the river of worship. Holy Spirit, teach us how to love you when you're speaking to us about the issues of our hearts. Holy Spirit, teach us to be as receptive when you're saying, I want you to repent of this or don't do that anymore. Or I want to take this or this needs to go or that relationship needs to end. Is pulling you. You're not doing the influencing. You're being influenced. Come out from among them. This word today is a harbinger. And it started out very global and very exciting. And then our God then turned it and made it very personal. <laughs> and very inviting. So we could look at our hearts. Holy Spirit would not be doing this right now if Holy Spirit didn't want to move some things out of the way so he could open up the spigot more. So the river could flow deeper. Mm -hmm. 
moves like this are very intentional on the part of God. If we want the river to flow deeper, we'll be willing to respond to Holy Spirit. I pray you're receiving this word today. Church, about 20% of what was in the notes was what was released today, which tells me Spirit of the living God released the majority of this message in Rhema for us. I want us to do two things. Respond to Holy Spirit. And as you're responding, prepare your heart for communion. The two things go hand in hand because Paul said before we take communion, we need to let Holy Spirit search our hearts. And if Holy Spirit reveals anything, we need to respond. We need to repent. You know, my wise pastor, mentor, friend, and dad once said to me when I was struggling with something. He said, Andrew, there's nothing worth holding on to that will hinder the anointing of God in your life. Wise words from a wise man. Let me speak those words to you right now. There's nothing worth holding on to that's going to hinder the flow of the anointing of God in your life. Unforgiveness, bitterness, anger, pornography, fornication, idolatry, iniquity, anger. There's nothing worth holding on to that's going to hinder the anointing in your life. It's just not worth it. There may be somebody in this room or somebody listening online, you may be offended with God and you may need to forgive God for something. A loved one died, a relationship ended, a marriage fell to the ground. You were released from a job. You were cheated out of something. You were betrayed. You were abandoned. You were neglected. You know, in the realm of deliverance, abandonment is always more difficult than rejection. Maybe there's an orphan spirit and you've always felt like you're on the outside looking in. When Jesus shows you before the foundations of the world for you to be on the inside looking out. Now is the time to say, Lord Jesus, I repent. You know, if it's unforgiveness and you repent, don't be surprised if you don't bump into whoever it is in the next few weeks. Or get a call or a text or a letter. If they're no longer walking the earth, the Lord may just say, let's just do this right now. Forgive and release. There may be some in this room that dad hurts you, mom hurts you, brother hurts you, church people hurt you, pastor hurt you. You know, this is a house for healing. It's a hospital in some ways. And sometimes God will bring people here and I can tell from the moment I meet them they've been wounded by shepherds. Controlled, manipulated, hurt. And the Holy Spirit will say to me, this is what happened. Now I want to use you to be like the balm of Gilead to them. May the Lord release the balm of Gilead in this room right now. That precious balm that is made from a root that grows from a flowering plant at the top of a mountain that men risk their lives to go get. Jesus gave his life so the balm of Gilead could be poured out on your heart right now. Some of you have been saying, Lord, I want more of your presence in my life. Holy Spirit, I want a greater anointing. And Holy Spirit saying, I want you to let go of this thing. I want you to repent. What? What? Lord, you didn't care about that in a previous season. Well, now it's time. Yes. I worked my way to it. Now it's time. 
God knows the right time for everything. Might be somebody in the room that said to the Lord, Lord, I'll do anything but this. Knowing it's the exact calling that's on your life. It just wasn't what you thought it would be. But are you willing to be the almond tree that the master cut down and laid in the sun and stripped bare so that he could use it as his walking stick. So it would learn the hand of the master and lay its dreams down. That almond rod that would eventually become Aaron's budding rod in the tabernacle. Are you willing? <laughs> yes, Lord. I sort of like to say, be quiet and let me work. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Holy Spirit, may we love your presence no matter where we are in the river. Holy Spirit, I thank you now for this place of repentance that you brought us into. We receive it in the name of Jesus. And Lord, I just plead your blood over everyone that's praying right now. Lord, help us let go. Help us surrender. Help us submit to you. Lord, now I pray as we're surrendering things to you, may you prepare our hearts for communion. Lord, I think you love the fact today that we flowed in the river in repentance and are about to flow in communion. Lord, all aspects of who you are and what you're leading us into. Lord, I pray now as things are being laid down and let go of. Lord God, that that would open up a place to be cleansed by the Holy Spirit. Lord, that you can now put the blood on the outside and the lamb on the inside. May you fill those areas now with your glory. Lord, for those that have repented but need to go home and get rid of something, make a phone call, make a text, release something, whatever it may be, God, give them strength. Lord, for those that you're wanting to change attitudes and motives and thoughts, God, give them strength. Lord, may this not be a time of prayer that we leave and we forget about what you put on our hearts. May we not be like the man who looks in the mirror and then walks away and forgets what he looks like. But Lord, may you finish what you started in us today. Help us divinely partner with you in that, the bride and the bridegroom. Lord, I pray now as we're about to partake of the bread and the cup, Lord, I thank you that healing is the children's bread. Lord, I ask as Natasha partakes of the bread, may healing be released over Leah. Lord, I pray as we eat of the bread, Lord, may physical, mental, emotional, physical, financial needs be touched and healed. 
Lord, as we drink of the cup, may deliverance flow over everyone's house. And Lord, we ask this, Lord Jesus, in your precious name. Thank you for your body that was broken for our sake. Thank you for your blood that was shed. Lord, we're about to do this in remembrance of you. In Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord is good. Amen. Amen. And his mercy endures forever. Is anybody thinking in your heart right now other than thoughts of repentance? Lord, I want to stay in the river. Lord, I want to stay in the river. I feel in the Lord we're on the precipice of something. Like there is a great and mighty flood that's being held back right now that's about to be released. Hallelujah. Let's stand. And I'm going to ask everybody in this far section first that kind of is in, to come to the middle and begin to retrieve your community items and then to go back through the middle if you would. Then we'll have this group move over to the aisle that folks are traveling through right now. Come around and grab your communion items. And then this group can come to the middle and around and back. So let's have this section come forth. Yes. Lord, I pray over everyone who comes and partakes today. Lord, as we repented and confessed, may now an anointing of shalom come. Yes, Lord. Thank you. 
God today. Amen. Amen. The Lord said this is just the beginning. You know, the word says we believe in our heart, but we confess with our mouth. That's why all of us have us confess the covenant during this time. Because the shed blood of Jesus opened up the covenant for us. Amen. And we walk in the blessings and benefits and provision of that covenant. So let's lift the bread up before the Lord. The bread represents his body, the word says. Just repeat after me and say, Lord Jesus, I thank you for your body that was broken for my sake. I receive this day everything that your broken body purchased for me for my family, for my generation, and for Israel. In Jesus' name. 
Church, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this bread represents my body, which will be broken for your sake. And before I say the rest, I just heard Holy Spirit say, for some people with the decisions you've made today and the repentance that you've willingly, wholeheartedly entered into, this communion is gonna shift something in your life. Because communion is so much more than something we do once a month. It's a time of thanksgiving, of celebration, of covenant, of remembrance, of healing. The Lord said this through the Syrophoenician woman seeking healing. Is it right to take the children's bread and to give it to the dogs? But she said, Lord, but even the dogs eat from the scraps that fall from the children's table. And Jesus said, what great faith. Therefore, I decree and declare that the bread is healing in the Lord, the broken body. And it is ours through the new covenant in his blood. He said, this do in remembrance of me. Let us partake. Now let's hold the cup up before the Lord. Oh, how precious the blood of Jesus. The old hymn writer said generations ago, Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Just say, Lord Jesus, I thank you for your blood that was shed for my sake. I receive everything that your shed blood purchased for me, for my family, for my generation, and for Israel. Church, the Lord Jesus on the night that he was betrayed took the cup and he said, this cup represents my blood that will be shed for your sake. And then Mark went on to write that he also said, and I will not partake of the fruit of the vine again until we're all together. Bo Yeshua Bo. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Say that with me. Bo Yeshua Bo. Come, Lord Jesus, come. And the Lord said, this do in remembrance of me. Let us partake together. Hallelujah. The Lord is good. And his mercy endures forever. Amen. Say that with me. The Lord is good. And his mercy endures forever. Oh, hallelujah. God is good, isn't he? He is holy, holy, holy. Is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive all glory, all honor, all power all praise, and all dominion. I pray now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord turn his countenance towards you and fill you with shalom peace. Nothing missing, nothing broken. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, hallelujah.